Hello, everyone. Welcome. Come on in. Use the chat. Let us know where you are tuning in from. Always so fun to see where people are joining us from in these virtual days. I'm going to give it a few minutes for some more people to tune in. Mercer Island, Huntington Beach, California, Illinois, yay, Illinois. Bellingham, hi from Magnolia, from the Renton Highlands, from Seattle. Welcome, welcome. Bellevue, Zanesville, Ohio, I love it. Whidbey Island. Ah, oh, you're welcome. Greenwood. Thank you, thank you. All right, it looks like our numbers are kind of leveling off there a little bit, so we will go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. I'm Lara Hamilton. I have a cookbook shop uh, in Seattle called Book Larder. And um, it is a shop where normally we do lots of in-person author talks and cooking classes and things like that. So we have taken those online and um, appreciate you sort of going on this virtual journey with us as we um, try, to, try to make the best of a strange situation and welcome more of you really from all over the country to our talks. Thank you for doing that with us. I am absolutely thrilled to welcome Kate McDermott. She is the author of this, her third book, Pie Camp. She is a longtime friend of Book Larder and someone that I've had the pleasure of knowing for over 10 years now, which is kind of crazy. Um, I went to one of her first version pie classes back in 2009. And um, I'm just so happy that she has brought what she teaches in her singular classes to her books. And so she is um, at her home and she's going to join pop in here in just a minute. The book, of course, is available on booklarder.com. We have book plates from Kate. So it'll be the next best thing to having a signed copy of the book if you would like to get that. And um, we are, of course, going to take your questions throughout the talk. So if you could please use the little Q&A button at the bottom of your screen in Zoom to ask the questions, it'll make it easier for me to sort of keep track of everything that's going on. All right, so I'm gonna ask Kate to join us now. Hello. Hi, Laura, how are you? I'm very well, how are you? I'm your great. warm welcome. and cozy kitchen there. Welcome to my pie cottage kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> It's so I'm good really to see you. To, I'm happy to have everyone here. Yeah. So Kate, pie camp. I know, I know. Yay. So is, beautiful, congratulations. Thank you so much. If, I think of the three books as um, my daughters. They're like the three sisters and I'm so proud of them all, but I have to say, um, I think I'm proudest of my youngest girl. Ah, yes. I was <laughs> going to ask you about that. You know, so you've written, obviously, Art of the Pie was your first book. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, not to ask you to compare your children, but <laughs> if, you, <laughs> if you were going to do that, how would you say um, this book sort of is different from or maybe is just uh, a little bit of an enhancement to, I don't know, um, Art of the Pie? Well, I think all three of my books are unique, so <laughs> that's yes. the same way to put that. But I would say um, because my my second book is on home cooking, mm -hmm. um, and we want to talk pie tonight. Unless there's a home cooking question, that's fine too. But yeah, yeah. Um, so art of the pie is really came out of teaching um, the classes um, I had been. I wrote Art of the Pie in 2014, 2015. It was published in 2016. And at that point, I had started teaching pie making in 2008. You came to a class in 2009. And, um, you know, that I, I learned how to present pie making in a way that uh, 
was, I think, accessible to people and that the recipes, I love the recipes in Art of the Pie. Now, mm -hmm. there's a lot of personal narrative in Art of the Pie. It's kind of like uh, somebody said to me, it's like, wow, Art of the Pie is like, the recipes are great. I learned how to make pie, but it's also like, why to make pie? Why to make mm -hmm. pie? And so um, then I was asked, uh, my publisher asked if I would do a second pie book. I was like, oh, really? And, but now this is more of a, uh, it's a very fast paced, um, it's not, I don't wanna say it's technical, technical because there's a lot of personal narrative still in there, mm -hmm. but it takes you to a place where now there are, here are 12, 13 master recipes and you can learn these and then mix and match what you want to do. Of course, there are, are lots of recipes that are from the beginning to the end in there, but there's lots of information in there of like, okay, I want to make a layered pie. Okay, here are the steps you need. I want to make a chiffon pie. Okay, here are the steps you need. I want to make a custard pie or a fruit pie or, you know, little pilots, you know, small pies. Here are the steps you need. And one of the ones that I think is just I haven't seen it anywhere else, I don't think, you know, maybe, you know, the, the pie book world better than I, Laura, is I did a section in there on how to do multiple pies for, uh, there's a section on how to do 28 pies for a wedding without going crazy. Oh, wow. Yeah, that is, um, I don't think that I have quite seen that before. So, yeah, so for sure. Um, so since the other book came out, you have taught so many more classes and obviously baked lots more pies. What are some of the things that you learned that were sort of new things for you that you brought to this book? Ah, I have new doughs. I continue to learn. Every class that I teach, every pie that I make, as you know, as you may not believe this, but I learn something at every single class. Yeah, I, really oh, I do believe that. Yeah. And it can be some, one of the best ways to learn, I think. Yes, it's a small, you know, it's a small little tricks. It's refining things. It's like, oh, I can make a crostata on a little, um, like I have a, a, a large uh, cake lifter and I can make the crostata, right? You know, flour that and, and um, it's like a big spatula and I can make the crostata and they're like, slide it off. You know, like, <laughs> yeah. I think this, you know, I think of this before. So there i love the new doughs that are in here i have a new gluten-free dough recipe that i absolutely adore and it's so different than uh when i the, the recipe for gluten-free dough in our the pie which is one of like you know what 10 different doughs in our the pie um gluten-free off the shelf flowers when i started making gluten-free they were not available in 2006 when I was learning to bake gluten-free. Mm -hmm. Now, so I created a, you know, a flour mix and, you know, went through a year of, of, of how to do that. Now, there's these fabulous gluten-free all-purpose flour mixes. Yeah. That now it's like, oh, I don't have to do that. Okay, well, let's create a new recipe. So I love that one. And I have a, a new, uh, two of my favorites in um, recipes for dough in there is the one cup out dough, which uh, uses mm -hmm. all purpose flour and also the cream cheese dough, which also uses all purpose flour. And these yeah. are just, they're, they're easy recipes. They, you know, make it so easy to make and roll. And you're just like, you know, I can make this dough and I can roll it out and I can be a pie maker. And, you know, I keep going and like, wow, I'm just continue to learn. I, I love this craft. Yeah, yeah. No, it's really great. And I also really appreciate all of your, I'm going to try to lift them up here so people can see it, like all of your sort of step-by-step -step photos that are really all through the book, they are. which are just so helpful. Yeah. And then in terms of like the new things that, um, that you've learned, I also feel like you've got I don't know, just sort of like you're, you're filling flavors. It feels like you were a little, not that, not that art of the pie isn't playful, but it feels like you were, you went even a little further with some of these that like you really oh, sort of played yeah. some new, some yeah. new ideas. What are some of your favorites or the things that you sort of surprised you? Oh, wow. Well, there's, you know, I'm, I'm putting uh, <laughs> bourbon in pies and cardamom yeah. in pies and, uh, uh, you know, kind of like go to the spice rack and said, hmm, 
I wonder what that would be like in there and different liqueurs and um, uh, different vinegars. You know, I didn't want to limit myself to, there, there's an old fashioned recipe for vinegar pie, okay? Mm -hmm. And vinegar pie is one that, you know, it's in a section that I call kitchen cupboard pies, which would be what, you know, now it'd be like what our great grandmothers uh, would have made. And these are pies that, you know, what's on the shelf? What have I got? I want to put a pie on the table. I've got some flour. I've got butter. I've got eggs. I've got, you know, I'm going to, and sugar, I'm going to make a pie. Well, a vinegar pie uses vinegar and which sounds like, oh, isn't that going to just be too acidic? Well, it gives like a lemony. Uh, quality mm -hmm. to that pot. Well, I thought, well, what would happen if I use some different flavored vinegars? So I started using was that, well, this gives it a whole different flavor profile. Yeah. So, you know, use, if you, if you go to the fancy vinegar store or, you know, and you see one you like, you know, we'll put it in a vinegar pie, you know? So the book is called Pie Camp, and obviously you have been, you know, doing these, your, your pie classes have sort of evolved into camps. What are sort of the aspects of pie camp that you really wanted to try to recreate with this book? Oh, uh, yeah. Well, people have said to me, um, well, let me back up here. So after taking the one day or the, you know, the half day class of, you know, or the pie of, you know, how to make pie, uh, people said, well, what else do you have? We want more. Mm -hmm. So I said, like, okay, what can I do here? So I, I, I started Pie Camp, which became um, the first one was like six days long. How in my, how could I have ever done that? You know, um, but you know, I, I did, <laughs> and um, uh, they settled um, down to like between three and four days long. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, four days, and during that time, people. Uh, are either with me or, or staying somewhere else. You know, I, I actually was renting a place where people were staying and I was also cooking for them also. In addition to getting up at six in the morning and prepping for classes and then teaching all day long and feeding them. And then they go home like at nine o'clock at night to wherever they're sleeping and then starting it all. And I'm up until like one. During that time, what I heard from people was, oh my gosh, Kate, this is like a pie brain dump. You're just like, you know, I could talk for four days straight. I could talk for two weeks straight about pie making and still have more. So this book, Pie Camp, is like that. It's like, let me pour every single thing that I can into these pages for you because at, especially at this time of our world, you're probably not coming to my house right now. Yeah. And so let me just pour it all into these pages for you so that you can be as much as possible. You can be here with me, uh, you know, and sometimes you come to a virtual class and then you can be right here with me like this. Yeah. Yeah. No. And I, um, you know, was going to kind of save that for the end. But since we're on the subject, um, you are doing sort of virtual classes now that it seems like this uh, book could be a really great companion to what kinds of things do can people experience in your virtual classes? Okay, so we make, um, we start by making three, at least three different doughs, we learn how to make three different doughs. Uh, and then we make uh, small hand pies, crostatas, learning how to make, you know, little, little pilots, you no, know, for one or two, we play with different flavor combinations, then we learn how to do, you know, maybe we're making a, uh, a lemon meringue pie to learn how to make the, the curd and the meringue, or we're making a chiffon pie to learn how to make the chiffon process with the gelatin, and then we're learning how to make um, a fruit pie. Uh, and then we make lattice or we learn how to decorate the tops and we play with the, the edges. But more interestingly is when I am teaching virtually and I maybe have 25 people from all across North America in Europe and maybe as far away, I've had somebody as far away as, as Dubai. Oh, wow. Okay. So I have people that are at different altitudes. Mm -hmm. Now, when they are wow. at different altitudes, we have some issues, some, you know, some challenges of, you know, your big time 
um, is going to be different. Your baking whole scenario is different at 8,600 feet than it is where I am at sea level in Port Angeles, Washington. Okay. So I am able to actually troubleshoot with you in virtual reality of what is your, what, what are we doing? What's the pie doing now? Let's change that temperature. Let's cover that with foil. Let's have it in there longer. Oh, it's ready now. And so in virtual pie camps, I am able, you are able to be in your kitchen using your tools and your oven. And I'm able to help you troubleshoot. Hopefully it goes smoothly. <laughs> so that you can have a successful bake in yeah. using your tools. Yeah. And that's something that I never could have even thought about because people came to my classes and they go make it, you know, oh, I make pie. Well, maybe they go home to somewhere at, in Colorado at altitude and like, whoa, the pie, the, it didn't get done. Yeah. So yeah. here's, and so this is fabulous. Yeah, or their kitchen's hotter, or their oven isn't quite as calibrated as yours. Like all those kinds of things you can help somebody troubleshoot. That's really- Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, one of the things that you mentioned was, you know, sort of the crostatas and the hand pies and all those things. And that was one of the things that I love about this book is um, that you've got sort of all, you know, this isn't just like always making, you know, sort of a full pie. This is like using your canning lids to make pies. Yes. You know, doing little crostatas. Yeah. yeah. Muffin, uh, tins. Exactly. Uh, muffin tins, canning lids, um, free form, uh, all, you know, pretty much everything is fair game. And one of my favorite things is looking in your, I don't want to say it's totally your junk drawer, but <laughs> you can, the section that has um, how to do edges on a pie, mm -hmm. I look, everything is fair game. My old, you know, can opener, the one that you do this that has the point on it. Oh, yeah, yeah. That yeah. makes a fabulous little crimpy edge that you can do or taking a chopstick and, you know, making holes in the edge of your pie. You know, I'm, I'm looking at sculpting tools in a different way and going, well, can I make a little swoopy thing with my sculpting tools? Yeah. Oh, it's so cool. It's so cool. And I think especially now, since we've been spending more time at home and probably cleaning out our junk drawers and all those kinds of things, if uh, the lines at Goodwill are any kind of indication. <laughs> totally. So, so um, Tell me, Kate, a little bit about, um, you know, we've, we've sort of talked around the whole situation that we're all in right now. What has that been for you? And like, what, um, how have you been spending your time and what have you been baking? Oh, wow. Well, um, it's been, um, it's been uh, interesting. I, uh, I, as we know, none of this was what any of us anticipated happening. And I have, you know, I've of course jumped on the sourdough bandwagon and uh, I still, even though I don't eat um, gluten myself, um, my son and his partner, they do. So I do a lot of gluten full baking for them. <laughs> there you go. Fun, you know, and then um, I would say um, I just continue to bake even if I, even if there's nobody coming into my home, I can still give things away mm -hmm. and I do. So I have, you know, I kind of, I have a 94 year old neighbor across the street. Mm -hmm. She is, she is still quarantining by herself. Yeah. And, um, you know, she has, there's some care people that do come in, but you know, it means the world to her that I drop something off or yeah. someone up the street, or I drop it off at my local bookstore, or, you know, so those kind of things um, are ways that I can still connect with people, and, um, and so I'm doing a lot of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's lovely. Yeah. And then the teaching, the virtual teaching. Yeah. Uh, and also just kind of taking a breather, and like reacquainting myself, at, you know, doing three books in four years, three big books in four years, um a lot. Really having a little breather and reacquainting myself with my garden and mm -hmm. like there are a book that like you know maybe I'm reading a book for fun 
<laughs> it's yeah. a whole novel concept. <laughs> That's good. You can focus on that. I struggled with that right at the beginning of all of it. That like I couldn't like read more than about two sentences at a time. So yeah. Yeah, and I think that there, I think baking in general is a therapy that helps us through this time for a number of of you know a number of avenues of this time it's so wild and crazy and, and i'd rather um i i find you know in in art of the pie i have i have three rules of baking and life which i also include in pie camp um, um keep everything chilled especially yourself yeah um, <laughs> boundaries and vent and i would rather like vent appropriately with my lattice strips than to take a rolling pin and and bash something because i you know things are <laughs> happening or you know yeah yeah totally totally and speaking of your lattice strips and your edges i just wanted to show folks i found the page where you have all the different yeah sort of ways of doing those edges and we actually if you give give me a second here we have a question about edges so um, Teresa says, I I'm, I, I'm struggling with getting the pie crust dough properly laid into the pie plate and crimped. My dough slides down the sides. What tips can you give? Okay, so Teresa, um, what I would suggest is um, roll out, um, I'm gonna ask for some clarification on this too. Uh, but I would roll out your dough so it's probably one and a half to two inches larger than your pie pan. And then when you lay it in gently, don't stretch it. If you stretch a dough, it will stretch back in the bake. It's just the nature of it. It's like, oh, you want me to go this way? Well, I really want to be this way. So roll it out and then actually let it rest. You might want to um, uh, chill your pie pan, roll out that chili dough, put it into the fridge while you're making your filling, and then um, you know roll out your other dough, put it on top, and then chill it until you put it in. On the, uh, if you are doing a blind baked dough and having it sink down, I'd strongly suggest uh, kind of anchoring the dough on the edges, actually make it just a little bigger than you want because it's the nature of pie dough to shrink some in the bake, but freeze your work before you bake it. Freeze it for at least a half an hour. You could even freeze it overnight. Then when you're going to blind bake it, uh, take it out and set it on a counter while you preheat your oven so it's not going in like cold, 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 okay? And then put it in and do your blind bake. Be, uh, be sure and also fill it up with weights all the way to the top. So if a nine inch shallow pie pan takes say one and three quarters pounds of fruit, that's really the amount of pie weights by weight you wanna put in that pan also. Put some um, a sheet pan liner or parchment paper or foil in there to hold those weights. But I find that just putting a few little weights on the bottom, my sides slide down. Mm. Yeah, that's good. And then along those lines, Beth wanted to know what are your favorite crimping styles, and do you have any tips for crimping so that it keeps it its shape during baking? Well, I think the thing about um, chilling it and freezing it yeah. uh, is really great. Um, I, quite frankly, the two that I do the most, well, actually there are three that I do the most, is um, with a fork like my grandmother, but, but I have a little cocktail fork. It's so cute, uh -huh. um, you know, so you could do it with a herringbone on there too, but you know, it's a little fork and it looks really cute. Um, the, another one that is so easy that I love is just, you know, the, the one where you're crimping with two fingers on the outside of your dough, um, and one finger on the inside and pushing them in like this. And I go around like that. And then, um, you know, sometimes, um, actually, you know, those are the two biggest ones. I was going to say the, the third one was using a regular size fork and then, um, but, 
Uh, those are probably the ones. Oh, and then sculpting tools. I have one that's like, it's got, it's like got this cup. It's almost, you know, it's tiny. The cup on it's tiny, but it's got a little curve on it. And I can actually go around and sculpt on there. And it just makes me look like a million bucks because <laughs> every single um, time that I go around, it's the same it's exact perfect. impression. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. like, wow. <laughs> No, that's nice. That's very nice. So you've got sort of a whole um, section on sort of tools and, and those kinds of things. So if someone were just getting started with pie baking, they've decided, you know, this fall pie is going to be their sourdough, they're going to really get into it. What are sort of those critical tools that they should have and, and the, just those stocking their kitchen things that they okay. should be thinking about? Well, I think the biggest thing is to get a rolling pin that is comfortable for you. And that um, if you can safely go to a store safely um, and pick your pin, it's almost like a wanding ceremony or that, you know, the cat <laughs> ceremony yeah. Harry, Harry Potter. Um, I, I like, uh, this is a double-ended uh, pin uh, that was made for me by one of my pie campers. And it has inlaid wood, you know, and I just love it. And he's put my name in here, but it fits my hand really well. Um, I like this, but you know, I went to um, when City Kitchens was in. Oh yeah. Oh my gosh! But one of the best kitchen stores in Loved the country. Loved it so much. Yeah. In Seattle, and they of course went out of business, which were so sad. But um, I was in there for like forty-five minutes, walking around passing a pins from hand to hand until a double ended one is the one that chose me. <laughs> now, I have all sorts of pins. And sometimes they you know, uh, uh, so a good pin. Um, I think a, a good knife, a really nice knife that uh, you're comfortable using and keep it sharp. A sharp knife is a safe knife because if you're cutting an apple and you're cutting with a dull knife, it's going to bounce off and you can get cut. So a sharp knife, just be careful and use your fingers like a little bear paw. Um, I like to roll out on a pastry cloth, but basically, and this is just, uh, it's uh, cotton denim. I just, you know, surge the edges. You can buy them also. Uh, I could surge the edges and I roll out on that. I love this because my extra flour goes down into the weave, um, but, you can roll out on marble, on wood, on plastic wrap, on the shiny side of freezer wrap, on seal pots, on roll pots. You can clean off the backside of a neoprene sleeping bag and roll out on that. <laughs> so what, but I really suggest having something between your surface and the dough. So it's not a happy moment if you're rolling out a dough and you go, oh, look, it's beautiful, it's beautiful. And then you can't get it off the counter. Yeah. So if you have it on something, parchment paper, sheet pan liner, anything yeah, that's well floured, then you can brush off that extra flour and you can get it off without having, a, you know, you want a Zen moment. <laughs> you know, I'm going to get this off, you know. So um, I would say, and then a pie pan that you really like, it can be, uh, uh, I love, the French ones because mm -hmm. they're so pretty. <laughs> and I have a few of those. And I think the other thing that's important is a reliable oven. And yeah. that you know the, the tricks of your oven. You know where its hot spots are, its cool spots. Always make sure, I was saying to somebody today, one of the most important things in your oven is that you keep the gasket clean. The gasket that goes around on side of the oh, drawer. Right. So have a little brush, fun. brush that stuff out. If you get, uh, you know, spill over from whatever you're cooking in there, clean it because you can lose the integrity of that gasket, which then will lose the heat in your oven. So yeah. an oven that, um, and it doesn't have to be a, an expensive oven. You, it just has to work. It yeah. has to be reliable. So Andrea, along those lines, um, just asked, how do you discover your oven's quirks? I'm so glad you asked. Ah, this is a good, this is good. I do the toast test. So in my oven, 
I'll just pull out a rack here. My oven has telescoping racks. It's very cool. Oh, wow. So um, I put on here uh, bread, white bread that I get, you know, like Wonder Bread, okay? And I save it for the birds when I'm done with it. And I put in rows, um, slice, 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 slice. So on my rack, I can put three rows of five pieces each with a small amount of space in between. And then I turn my oven to 325 and I let my bread toast. And then I can see if I have hot spots in maybe the front or in the back corner or, you know, or cool spots. And then I turn all, of, you know, I kind of look at that, all that bread, like one big piece of toast and see, is it even? And then yeah. you can actually turn all the pieces over, bing, 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 bing. And then you look at the back and say, oh, look, what is it doing on the bottom also? Mm -hmm. now, if you have a number of different settings on your oven, I have a traditional bake, single rack convection and multi-rack convection. Wow. So I did the, and I have three racks in this oven and I have two of them. So I did the toast test on all those settings using one rack, two rack, three racks. I can't tell you the size. I went through 11 loaves wow. of bread and I took pictures of everything. Well, I was going to say, and then you have to take pictures and notes so you can remember what you've done. I did. <laughs> yeah. I did. So I have that in case anything ever happens, I can say to the tech, well, this is what it was like at the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. And so then it's a matter of either adjusting, sort of making sure you're turning your pie or even getting your oven calibrated if it's something that's really very important. Yeah. Now, a 25 degree difference, that's not the end of the world. Right. But a 75 degree difference up or down, that can be the difference between a, a pie that doesn't bake or a pie that burns. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Or that's like really done on the outside and raw on the inside or vice versa. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Yeah. I used to um, jokingly say get three oven thermometers and if two of them agree, then that's the right temperature. Yeah. Well, you do in your book, you have the, I just got one of them, the little laser. Oh gosh. Actually. Yeah. Should I get mine to show? Let's see. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hold on. Let's see. Where did I put that? I just I can't believe like how handy it is and how it how it also really helped me. Um, like I knew my oven had problems, though I've never quite. <laughs> I need to try what you've just described, though. Here it uh, is, right here. Okay. Yeah, there you go. So this is an infrared uh, thermometer, and uh, this one goes from uh, fifty-eight degrees Fahrenheit to ten hundred and twenty-two degrees Fahrenheit. Now you're not gonna have anything cooking at 1022 degrees Fahrenheit, which would be 500 maybe, right? But what this does is I can tell, um, you know, the temperature of my dough, I can tell actually the temperature of my hands. Because when we also think of like, keeping everything chilled, especially yourself, butter starts warming up, it starts getting soft at 59 degrees. Well, my hands right now are 85.4. If I touch my butter, a lot, it's going to start getting too soft and coating everything and getting really greasy. So keeping chill, this is a way you can tell if you're, you know, what do I need to do? Do I need to hold some ice cubes? Um, and then, uh, you know, a temperature that I like to roll my doughs at is around, oh, 54, 55, 56 degrees, somewhere around in there. That's mm -hmm. what, that's what I like to roll my doughs at. Mm -hmm. And so you would have like the ice there and you'd kind of handle your dough a bit, maybe put your hands back in the ice and then continue. Yeah, have a, you can have an ice water bath or you can just hold ice cubes until you can't stand it anymore. And you can bring your hands down to 60 degrees <laughs> really fast. Yeah, yeah. Have you tried, um, I've never tried them, but I've seen them. We were talking about rolling pins, the sort of the marble rolling pins that you can get super cold. And do you like those? I have one. See what you get to do in my kitchen. I have one. Well, of course you do. Um, uh, and uh, it, it's so old that it doesn't even have the, you know, the, the pin things in it anymore. So, you know, I can use this one by uh, just by pushing. It's heavy. 
it's yeah. really heavy so you don't have to push as much um and um it does keep a cool temperature the temperature of this you know if you're geeky it's 72.8 whereas um well i don't know what the temperature of the other one but it, you know it will keep marble stays cool mm -hmm. you know i don't use it often if somebody came to my door it would be and i didn't want them here they were threatening this would be a really good one to use. <laughs> they would go to that <laughs> there you go <laughs> all right so i'm gonna um look at questions here and again we are using the q a button if anybody wants to uh join in so we have a couple of um well actually susan has two questions she would like to know what is your favorite unexpected ingredient to really make the old classic apple pie stand out or maybe it's more related to favorite types of apples and i think that's probably two questions yeah it is and both are so i go to the store or the farmer's market and i'll pick one of everything um some for sweet some for tart um some that hold their shape some that don't and i like to have a variety in in the apple pie it makes it very exciting to taste so it's not just one flavor of apples they just really do a wonderful thing together uh it really is the it's what what is that thing it's um the the elements are more than it the sum is more than the parts or something yeah, yeah. okay and then um well is greater than the sum of it yes yeah. thank you, thank you. <laughs> I, knew yeah, I knew i would yeah. get that. yeah yeah um and then i like to put in um I used to just, uh, well, I put in apple cider vinegar, like Bragg's or a good artisan apple cider vinegar, um, instead of lemon juice. You need to have a little acid in there. So I, I do that. Um, I've also put in an uh, apple liqueur. I used to put in Calvados all the time. I found it kind of a little hard to get the one that I used to love, which was um, Boulard. Mm. Um, I use Laird's Applejack. And if you can, there's directions in the book for making boiled cider. And mm -hmm. boiled cider, you, you, take a, you can take a quart or a gallon of cider and you just cook it down very, very, very slowly. You reduce it and it gets a little thicker and then it intensifies the apple flavor and put that in a pie. Of course, a little rum or a little bourbon, that's all fine too. No, that sounds lovely. One of the things that um, when you were talking about the apple varieties that I learned at your camp that I would have never thought of is um, I actually put a quince in, like a sliced quince in with my apple, which was the most delicious thing. Oh, I took all my quince outside. So um, yes, yes. Which I would have never thought about doing that. And it just, yes. it just made, you know, like periodically you'd get these bites that were just a little more floral and it, it added some mm -hmm. lovely color to the pie mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, and and those, just, sorry, go ahead. Oh, well the quince, uh, you know, they can be kind of bright flavored also. So I take them and I will actually, you know, it's like dicing it so that you have, it is that surprise. It yeah. Is surprise. yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. But one of the things I just wanted to share, um, and it might be harder to do now, since even at the farmers markets, we're not necessarily picking our own apples. But one of the things that you had suggested was to take your pie plate with you when you go to choose your apples and sort of, you know, pick the, you know, sort of fill up your pie plate and mound the apples in your pie plate. And then, you know, sort of how many to get. But it was also so fun to do that and just, um, it was sort of just a very visual way to sort of think through the textures and the flavors and all the different, I mean, didn't leave the peels on, but all the different colors. It was just like such a fun thing to do. Right. The first times that I made apple pie. And yeah. so. And so, so now in, in the books, I've got the, um, you know, kind of the amount weight wise. Yeah. Um, you would need to buy. And, you know, really for a nine inch uh, deep dish pan, you want about, uh three three and a half pounds of apples or pears yeah 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 with a quince in there if you want with to. a little quince yeah <laughs> yeah um let's see oh uh susan's other question actually since we were on the subject of apple pie was she wanted to know how long you can safely freeze a fruit pie um i will freeze it um you know rule of thumb is kind of like a month but i've gone longer i have 
taken the pie and I'll let it cool. Well, okay, so if it is a uncooked pie, okay, um, I will uh, wrap it in uh, plastic wrap. Plastic wrap, I'm so sorry. It is my guilty pleasure, I'm sorry. Um, and then I'll put foil on the outside of that. So, yeah. you know, I've got it, or actually I can't remember which way I do it, but I use both. So it's, it's in there. And I have had um, pies that I've pulled out um, that have been longer than one month, you know, six weeks, two months. If it doesn't have freezer burn and looks like it, the integrity of the pie is looking good, I use it. Yeah, yeah. All right, another question here from Joan while we were talking about ovens. She would like to know, uh, does gas or electric oven work better for baking? And what do you think of convection? Okay, these are great questions, Joan. So for over um, 45, 50 years, I have, sorry, I am old. Um, I baked with gas. And I have actually right over here next to my electric ovens, I do have my trusty old propane oven. And I have baked very successfully with propane, which is a heavy wet heat um, for decades and decades. You just have to learn that heat of how to assess if it's done or not. And by doing that, really I'm saying, use your senses. Does it smell right? Does it look right when you take it out of the oven? Do you see steaming coming through the vents? Can you hear it bubbling, boiling inside and coming up and hitting the bottom of the upper crust? I call it the sizzle whomp. And you need to see that. And it doesn't matter whether it's in that oven or whether it's in electric ovens. Now, with my electric ovens, which are new, you know, for me, these are now three years old. To me, that's new. Um, and I've named them, this is thing one and thing two, and they bake pies, they bake pies fast. Thing one and thing two will last and last. So that being said, they do have all three settings for traditional bake, which is not convection. Mm -hmm. It's a drier heat, you know, the electric. Uh, with convection on here, I've got the one rack and the two rack. Rule of thumb a long time ago was, if it is convection, turn the oven down 25 degrees. And I have found in many of the ovens that I have baked in across the country, uh, the older convection ovens, they really didn't work all that well. So um, you really had to know um, you know, it's like, you know, test it out, make some little cinnamon sugar roll-ups with dough and see how is it baking. These ovens have a little computer on the inside. So I can say, I want to bake at 425 on multi-rack convection. And it says, I will do the calculation for you on the inside. <laughs> and I will take care of any adjustment. And I have, I love these ovens, uh, you yeah. know, and I do have them, I have them, you know, somebody comes once a year and does a, you know, a checkup on them. Yeah. Yeah. Which I think is a good habit. If you're doing a lot of baking, that's a good habit to get into. It's took right. it took me entirely too long to realize that that was the problem with some of my baking was this that is I had my oven is. for like 15 years and I never had it checked on. So yeah. yeah, it is one of your most important parts of baking. You know, I want to say there's one other in, uh, tool that is important. It's your hands. Oh yeah. Hands. And you never lose them. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for sure. For you sure. may lose your marbles, but you don't. <laughs> um, so Lauren would like to know, do you have a favorite pie to make? and or a favorite pie to eat? Uh, well, during this season of the year, I'm, I'm taking a lot of produce in. And so, yes, I do love making uh, pear pies and apple pies. And you know, with the quince, of course, coming up, I'll be making cranberry pies, which I just love. But also, um, boy, I'm loving um, 
the the uh, chiffon pies that I have in the book of you know being able to make things like you know I have an eggnog pie in there and because I created that one because my son from the time he was a little boy loved to eat to drink eggnog so I created an eggnog pie and um, my mom loved Reese's peanut butter cups so I have a chocolate peanut butter pie in there that's dedicated to her which is like eating a Reese's peanut butter cup it's yeah. really good. So, you know, I think, and I, oh, one of my favorites right now, of course, is it's an Irish apple tart. And I learned how to make this over in Ireland when I was there last year. And I'm so glad I traveled last year. Oh, um, yeah. And it has a lovely custard sauce to it. And that's a lovely one to make during this season. It's, yeah. and then banana, banana cream pie. I think it's the best banana cream pie I've ever had, if I just humbly say so myself. Oh, wonderful. So enough with banana bread. We can all be making banana cream pie now, right? Yeah. And uh, bananas have tryptophan in them. So you can do it therapeutically. It'll, it'll come. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, make one for the election, right? You know, it's like, oh, oh, yeah. I'll just eat the in banana three, cream pie. I'll make a banana cream pie for sure. Um, so Joy, hello, Joy. Um, Joy says, hi, Kate, this is Joy the Baker. And uh, part of her question, I think you might have already talked a little bit about, but, but um, there's one uh, pie in here that will that will highlight for sure. Um, if not, I was lucky enough to receive an advanced copy of your book and I absolutely adore it. I made your apple pen dowdy just this afternoon and it's delicious. My question is, what's going to be your go to holiday pie this year and mm -hmm. what little tricks do you have to make it extra special? Mm, wow. Um, actually, I'm going to, this is going to surprise you, Joy. Um, I'm going to be making sonkers. I'm going to be making sonkers this year for holidays. And um, I'm going to be using my, the frozen fruits that I have for the season. Now a zonker is uh, specific to um, Surrey County in North Carolina. And Jenny Field, who is pastry chef online, uh, she was going on the Zonker Trail. And I said, the what? <laughs> and there is, you know, it's like she and her husband, you know, traveled around and they have a Zonker Festival. It's spelled S-O-N-K-E-R. And it's like a, it's got like a combination pie and biscuit crust, kind of. And you can, uh, you, you kind of pat it into the pie pan and I'm gonna, and then uh, roll out strips and put it on top. And then it's got this dip, this milk dip that you serve it with. And I'm gonna be putting in on this red gooseberries, green gooseberries, white currants, um, and native trailing blackberries from here. Oh Plus I'm gonna be putting in some, um, I have some, I'm gonna put in some seasonal cranberries and I'm, I was just talking to a friend the other day. I said, oh, I still have some of these things and I'm gonna be making this. So that's what I'm gonna be making. It's not quite traditional. And then I'll be making an eggnog pie for my son and I'll be putting enough, enough of the, um, the over 21 stuff in there to- um... <laughs> <laughs> It'll be very noggy, huh? Is that Enjoy, I'm so glad you like the book. It means a lot. Okay, I love this sonker idea. Do you have, are they in the book? I didn't notice yes. that. They yes, are? They oh, are. Okay. yes, they are. Yes, they're in the section on uh, pilots and um, oh, okay. pie yeah, yeah. The ones that are sort of outside the pie norm, basically. Uh -huh, uh -huh. But okay. they use all the same ingredients. Mm -hmm. It's flour, it's, it's butter, sugar. It's just, you know, a little, and it's just made slightly differently. No, I'm excited. Um, so we have two more sort of flavorish questions. One, Mary Lou would like to know what is your favorite thickener for fruit pies? Mm -hmm. Well, I uh, am a real fan of tapioca, tapioca starch. Uh, that can be either in the floury form or in the granular form, not the, not the round form that we do for um, tapioca pudding. Uh, but you know, it's, it's ground up some, I sort of feel it's like a pie maker's best friend. Now, when you use that, you must see steady bubbling. 
it has to, your filling has to boil for the thickener to do its work. And that also is included also if you're using cornstarch. Any filling has to boil so it can, um, the thickener can do its work. But I would say um, I, use, I use tapioca and I also mix thickener. So if I have a super, super juicy pie and I've maybe I've made it, rhubarb is super juicy, mm -hmm. cherries are super, but rhubarb is one of the biggest ones that's super juicy. I'll put in um, two and a half tablespoons of tapioca and then maybe I'll put in a tablespoon or two of flour on top of that to, to um, just make sure that it's all snugged up. Right, yeah. And then Beth would like to know, um, and this will probably be about the last question we have time for, what type of pumpkin from the farmer's market makes, makes the best filling for pumpkin pie? The Libby's can. Timely. The Libby's can. <laughs> You're not going to say winter luxury pumpkin? Well, or let me tell you. Okay. <laughs> I, years ago, decades ago, I used to live uh, and had a huge garden. And I... Um, I grew my pumpkins and I grew squash and I was so righteous, but I'm going to process this and that, you know, and I have to tell you that I had, it was kind of stringy and kind of watery. And um, there was a food stylist from many decades ago named Olivia Urshan. She was kind of broke the ceiling in the seventies for food stylists. Um, on the big on the big scale and uh, she had a book on pies and pastries and I was very fortunate to meet her and she said yeah she uses she uses the Libby can and the recipe on there too so I figured like you know if Olivia Urshan uh, used it I can use it too all right well and you did have I loved your pumpkin pie recipe in this book the pumpkin was a pumpkin chiffon I think with the there's orange a pumpkin leaf. chiffon yeah yeah. Yeah. It just looked amazing. And I'm not going to be able to find, uh, find the picture of it, but everybody should check that out. Cause is that the one that has really the, the, um, the orange, the candied orange. Is on yeah. It. Yeah. It just looked amazing. Um, and just it the, amazing. It's really and good. Yeah. But what? It's really good. The testers that did that, you know, they kind of look at it and said, really, really. And then they taste it. Said, oh my God. Yeah. It looks yeah. so good. Like just a way to kind of brighten it up a little bit. Cause it can, mm -hmm. you know, it can get a little, some people don't like the stodge, but not that yours would ever be stodgy, but you know, like some people don't like the density. And so that just would be a nice way to brighten it up. Yeah. And Kate, um, as we wrap up, you, um, you have sort of words of wisdom to share in your book. And, I, and typically. Yeah. So at this time in our world, I would like to say, be happy, stay home, <laughs> bake pie and vote. Excellent. Words of wisdom for all of us. Kate, thank you so very much for your time. Thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, as I mentioned at the top of the hour, um, pie camp is available at booklarder.com. And um, we have signed book plates from Kate. And so uh, you will get the next best thing to assign copy of the book. Thank you so much, Kate. Congratulations on your book. And um, I can't wait to see you in person. I that's can't great. wait to see you too. This was, this was good, but that's going to be a It's going to be a lot better. Yep. Hugs. And we'll Hugs. have to share pun. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you everyone for tuning in and happy baking. We will um, post this to our YouTube channel in the next couple of days. So if you missed it and you want to go or you want to just go back and watch parts, um, you'll be able to do that there. Thank you, everyone. Have a lovely evening. Happy baking.